social work and social welfare has developed in Canada through the careers of different people. Mm -hmm. um, it's um, the material is going to be put to a number of uses. Um, all of the interviews are being transcribed, so we'll have uh, a number of thousand pages. Of my name is Karen Hill. I'm in St. John's, Newfoundland, and today is the 27th of February, 1984. Uh, today I'm interviewing Ms. Frida Berry, uh, who's had a long experience in social work in Newfoundland. This is the Oral History of Social Work in Canada project, project of the Canadian Association of Social Workers. Ms. Berry, I wonder if in order to begin, you might tell us when and where you were born, mm -hmm. and a little bit about your early life. Way back. Uh, I was born in England, in London, in 1908, and, uh, well, had a Swedish mother and an English father, so a bit of a mixture with a French background, and uh, I was educated there right through, and um, I then went in for physical training, which we called it in those days, which is phys ed, went to college, and uh, taught for seven years in England, mm -hmm. and uh, came to Newfoundland in 1936. What induced you to come to Newfoundland? Everybody asks that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, in England, they have the uh, agencies for engaging teachers over the world, and uh, I rather wanted to see some of the world, and I applied for, well, quite a few uh, jobs. One was here, one was in Ceylon, which was the one I really wanted. Another one was in Tientsin, China, and one in California. And. Uh, the school principal here sent me a wire saying that she would like to engage me, but she wanted to know within three days. And I was teaching temporarily at a school in the southwest of England at the time, just for one term as a relieving sort of, or extra staff. I waited until the end of the third day, and I didn't get anything from the others at all, not a word, so I accepted. I didn't really even know where it was. I must say, I was terribly ignorant. I thought it was part of the mainland. And then uh, somebody gave me a history book, and, uh, uh, and uh, it gave me a little information on government and so on, and I shall never forget <laughs> reading that it was uh, the economy of Newfoundland was built by, up on greed, graft, and corruption. Because <laughs> this was following the Richard Squires problems here, of course. And I really wondered what I was coming to. Mm -hmm. But it was um, quite an adventure. You have to you come by boat, of course. You had to come by boat in those days. It took about six or seven days, I suppose. And we were met at the wharf. When I say we, there were three other teachers from Britain coming to the school I was going to, a girls' school, and one of the boys' schools here, the brother's school, Bishop Field College. I was at Bishop Spencer College. Uh, they were church schools. And uh, we were met by all the dignitaries on the wharf. And it was a day rather like today. It was sort of miserable. It was mm -hmm. raining. And uh, so my first impressions were incredible. Uh, it was just at the end of the uh, Depression. And there, were no, there was no paint on houses in those days, really. And the rain was dripping straight down. There were no eaves troughs. There was cobblestones on Water Street. And, horses and carts and a um, lot of very mangy dogs uh, and a sort of whole atmosphere of poverty. It was terribly sad, really. Um, however, <laughs> I don't know how far you want me to go on <laughs> with this, but it's... Uh, <laughs> just to con continue on. When you, when you first came to Newfoundland then in 1936, you were teaching at a school uh, a, gro a private the girls, girls' school. school. It was yes. I, I suppose one would call it private, but it, it was government supported too. A mm -hmm. small fees charged for stationery and this sort of thing. And um, it, in those days, of course, people chose what schools they wanted to send their children to. Not like now when it's zoned. So uh, we got some. Well, we're about four hundred and fifty, I suppose. Mm -hmm. girls at that time, and it was from the kindergarten right up to eventually grade 12 we had there. Mm -hmm. Although they dropped grade 12 after a year or two. And I taught them all uh, gymnastics, dancing, games, ran the sports. Mm -hmm. Also had to teach various subjects, <laughs> <laughs> like geography and religious yes. knowledge and things of that nature. 
Um, you see, orig oh, I should have, I've left out a bit. I originally was planning to be a, a missionary. I was mm -hmm. very immersed in the scriptures in those days. We had a very good teacher. And our school principal always decided what we were going to be. Mm -hmm. So I was going to go to the London School of Economics. But I got very frivolous in my last year or so. One couldn't go to college until you were 18 in England in those days. And so I decided I wanted to be a phys physical training type because I was also quite, you know, quite good at games or that kind of mm -hmm. thing. And uh, two or three friends had gone to physical training college. So that's how I came to be in my first profession, which was very helpful later on, as you'll probably see as we go on. Mm -hmm. But um, anyhow, it, it was a very happy place to be in here. People were extremely friendly, as they still are, and uh, I enjoyed it. But, uh, but it, what hit me, I think, perhaps, was uh, the terrific difference um, between the wealth and the poverty. There were very, very few people with plenty of money, and there were many very poor and there was a very small middle class, really. Um, cars were not very really frequent in those days. It was, it, there were very few cars on the streets, just those that had the money and sort of the business people, I suppose. But it was a, it was a terrific contrast. And um, I had an introduction to uh, a nurse here who had been, uh, well, I think she actually was still with the what was known as the uh, Child, Child Welfare Association, I think. It became, I, I can't remember the exact title of it, but she had told me stories of what she had found in visiting homes here. Um, they, the people had been burning their floorboards for warmth, and also they were sending their children out to beg uh, and if one went, say, to have a cup of coffee after some um, event, a uh, game or something, bowling or something of that nature, um, in the evenings, these little kids would, uh, about pint-sized, about half the size they are, you know, for their age, would come along with notes, very illiterately written, to say, please give my little boy and my little girl some money. We have no milk in the house. Haven't had any food for two days, and that sort of thing. It, it was real poverty at it, it its worst in those mm -hmm. days. Uh, and there was tremendous change, of course, later on when we confederated. Mm -hmm. Basically, mm -hmm. basically that change came then, but all during, war. During the time you were teaching at Bishop Spencer, um, were most children in Newfoundland um, uh, in school at that time? There was no uh, School Attendance Act until 1942, the year before I joined the Navy. Um, so therefore, there were quite a lot not attending. I think the city, the children in the city certainly were pretty well all in school, but around the outports, no. Mm -hmm. um, and that they had, of course, it was denominational too, you see, so that in one small outport, there'd probably be three one-room schools. And what would the denominations and, have been? Uh, they were basically, um, Anglican, United Church, Roman Catholic, and uh, eventually the Salvation Army also opened their own schools, and uh, more recently the Pentecostals. Mm -hmm. So there were vast, there's a vast spread. Uh, the the um, Anglican and United Church uh, finally joined together. Joined together. So. Uh, cut down the number of boards of education, but they're still, they're still denominational. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I suppose much more state supported. I haven't, of course, followed the educational end of things here no. that much, but. During your, your first years in Newfoundland, were you, uh, did you visit the outports at all? Uh, only in so far as the road went, because <laughs> in those days, um, the road ended at uh, Carbonear, I think it was. It was about 80 miles of of road out to there and and of course there were minor roads going down the coast so one went for drives but if you went out for instance to Brigus uh, which you can fly to in no time flat now you it was a day's expedition you ordered luncheon at tea rooms in Brigus and um, you drove out during the morning and had your lunch and then drove back in the afternoon and got home just by dark mm -hmm. now you would just 
you know, dash out there in that hour and a half. <laughs> Changed, changed. It was a great change of very, very um, narrow, rough roads. You know, there's only yeah. one paved road at all. Yeah. What was the, the um, state of um, electrification uh, in those days in Newfoundland? Uh, we had electricity. But I, I had. I was living in boarding houses. Mm -hmm. that. Oh yes, electricity in St. John's, but mm -hmm. not outside. It was oil lamps mostly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in certainly in the smaller centres. What I find difficult is to remember what I saw in 36 to 43 and what I saw when I came back here in 49, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. because things had changed mm -hmm. very much during the war. Mm -hmm. as well, why don't we talk about then <clears throat> what happened during the war and, and what you were doing during the Second World War? Well, um, I had always wanted to be in the Wrens. Uh, as a kid, I'd read stories of the British Wrens and all the things they did. And as I tried, first of all, to see if I could get into the British Wrens, but there was, I was home in England when the war broke out, with a two-year contract to come back here. And we, the four of us, were actually uh, at, back in England for the holidays. And I wired to see whether I could be released from the contract, but there was no way, and they said it was just as important to teach the children, and I, of course, agreed. So I came out on the first Atlantic convoy, which was quite an experience. We were the flagship, it was the SS Newfoundland, I think. And um, we had to go very far south. We had a lot of uh, merchant ships to convoy. The, um, we had es an escort of destroyers, a couple, I think, uh, south of Ireland, and they eventually returned. And we had one, one seaplane, which hovered about for a while, and then we were on our own. Um, and the, the, there was a, well, it was pretty difficult listening to radio because they were sinking these tankers uh, as we were traveling. And um, one night, just when we were nearing this, uh, nearing the harbor here, uh, there was a pit patting of, of guns, gunfire, and we were all told to get up and go down to the dining saloon. And uh, <laughs> it was a funny scramble, which, you know, you didn't want to be rescued in a nightgown or something, you know. What do you put on? A pair of slacks and a jacket, you know. <laughs> and uh, uh, we were actually under attack, but luckily we, we got away. And um, I said to the captain, whom I, I knew fairly well, he happened to be the father of uh, a child I was teaching at school, and he asked me if I'd like to go up on the bridge occasionally. So I, he came up and said, you want to see the entrance to the Narrows? I said, I'd very much like to see the entrance to the Narrows. And he said, I said, were we under attack last night? And he said, I can't say anything. I can only tell you I've never been so glad to see the, the entrance to the Narrows as I am today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm. we knew. Uh, mm. And meanwhile, they were all praying for us in school because uh, we had taken about eight, eight days, I think, do this trip. It normally took five or six then. So uh, we were very welcome when we got back uh -huh. here. Yeah. It was, yeah. you see, being as it was uh, right out in the Atlantic like this, we had a terrific blackout here too. And it was, it was very eerie at night times. So during that period, um, I was uh, on a nursing station as a St. John ambulance uh, person for any anything that might occur in the way of raids. And uh, we had a few warnings, but nothing very much. I mean, nothing ever happened. Uh, and we had some bad fires. They were, they were, we say, and <laughs> whether it was ever proven, I don't know, the work of spies here, because everywhere that was a big building that could be used for um, the wounded, uh, like the old Memorial College, gymnasium, the big skating rink down near the Newfoundland Hotel, um, the yacht club out round at Manuals, and they were all burned down in terrific fires. So it was somewhat exciting. I had to evacuate my own residence on Forest Road when the skating rink burned down. Mm -hmm. Windows were cracking. But this, this shows you how, what honest people the Newfoundlanders are, because we threw everything into blankets. You know, you don't know what to save first. And it just got thrown out into the garden. 
we were at Queen's College, which was the Anglican training college. We couldn't find anywhere else to live in those days because rents had gone sky high when the Americans came here. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't miss one. I, there was one book of everything I had that was missing. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. delivered all this stuff to an opposite house in the, mm -hmm. on Forest Road. And, you know, these strange people would come up and just take things from you, you know. They were waiting down the garden just to help. Mm -hmm. This is typical. Yeah, that's wonderful. why I like living here. <laughs> that's <laughs> wonderful. Different now, that's wonderful. Yeah. So you weren't accepted into the uh, into the British Wrens? N no, I had to wait because they could not. I applied then when the when the Canadian Wrens started up in 1942. I applied then, and they couldn't get a physical training teacher. So the principal begged me to cancel out and said the health of the kids was just as important. So my great disappointment, I cancelled out. But I got accepted in 43. Mm -hmm. And that was an interesting experience. I had so many friends across Canada from having been in the forces that mm -hmm. it's just great to do a trip here. Um, well, I started in the ranks at the bottom and uh, scrub floors and all that kind of thing. And um, I don't know, do you know Isabel McNeil? No. She was the uh, in charge of the training base at Gold, mm -hmm. which was the old girls' um, training school for delinquent girls, and uh, it was taken over by the Navy, and the Wrens had a training base there within those buildings. Was that in in Gold? In Gold, Ontario? yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, Isabel McNeil was in charge, and she she's a great friend of mine now. But she was a very austere person, just you know, one sort of lived in in awe of her, really. <laughs> and when I I had taken a, a young Newfoundlander with me on the train, who had never ever travelled before, and uh, she didn't have any money either, and we had quite a journey. I mean, that's a story in itself to mm -hmm. get to gold for training. We just had armbands on, and people wouldn't believe that we were already in the force because we just had armbands. And I had to pay all for all kinds of things, meals. We got some meal tickets, but we lined up and never got into the dining car and things like that. Yeah. <laughs> we had to take a taxi in, in North Sydney to, to the station and all this sort of thing. So I went to, I made a request to go and see the commanding officer. And I presented myself this morning and smartly saluted and said, Ma'am, I wish to ask for reimbursement of the money that I've spent on travelling here. We were not supposed to have any expenses. But she said, Very. Don't think there's anything in the regulations will allow that. <laughs> so I was turned down. In mm fact, -hmm. I had to go back to her a second time. Then, somewhat later, I became a petty officer. I was in the regulating branch, which meant that I also did, you know, it was discipline and it was drill and all that kind of thing, which was natural for me as my profession mm -hmm. helped me there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I became a petty officer and she said, sent for me and said, we need good petty officers. I'm not sending you to OTC. I said, that's fine, ma'am. It's very nice. I don't mind being a petty officer at all. <laughs> About a month later, she sent for me again and said, Barry, need good executive officers. Sending you to OTC. <laughs> So <laughs> in February of 44, I went to the OTC and then was appointed to um, HMC of Stadacona, Halifax. But I had leave coming to me first, so I came back here, and that, that was a trip in itself. It took four days to get from Ottawa here because um, there was ice in the Gulf, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we had to go from North Sydney up to Lewisburg. Uh, on a rattly old train with gas lamps, you know, swinging about in a stove in the far end of the mm -hmm. train. You, I'd never believe they still existed even then. And um, when we got out, there was a blizzard raging. That was at some time about midnight. And we all had to do lifeboat drill, and then we got into our bunks. And the bunks, there were six in mine, because everything was blacked out due to it being wartime. <laughs> And in a long involved down one corridor and down another, really in, enclosed, no portholes, of course, no air, and the the atmosphere was just terrible. Um, 
the condensation on the pipes, and I was on mm -hmm. a top bank. It just dripped all night. It was like a torch. You know? and there was one poor sm small boy who was in his heavy um, sweater, a navy type, very thick sweater and, and thick pants, and his uh, mother wouldn't let him undress because we might have to go on up top, you see, any moment. And he spent the whole night, Ma, I itch. Ma, I itch. <laughs> it was a delightful night. <laughs> so then we started to break through the ice and uh, try to cross the Cabot Strait, and uh, no way, we got stuck right out in the middle. It was beautiful, beautiful sunny day, and the ice was even seals on it at that time. And we just did nothing but stand in line to get a meal and then stand again in line to get a meal. We mm -hmm. had beef, potatoes and cabbage for both meals. Mm -hmm. it, it was really absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. um, they couldn't use too much in the way of signaling because it, uh, you know, the submarines could locate us. So uh, finally an air aircraft came over and led us to the nearest possible of splitting in the ice where we were able to make way and we got into Port of Basket at 3 o'clock in the morning, I think it was. Mm -hmm. I won a sweepstake over that. I, could, I drew the time. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky you. Well, that was a terrible trip. <laughs> Were there things about your military service that, that uh, affected your decision to go into social work? Yes. That's exactly what happened because mm -hmm. uh, as an officer, I was responsible for not only promotion and discipline, but also for any welfare, social welfare sort of problems with, mm -hmm. with the wrens. And so that led, led me to uh, all kinds of things, right up to illegitimate pregnancies and all this kind of thing, the vast number of, of problems that cropped up. And um, the, we had a welfare officer, Helen Parsons, who was a social worker, graduate of Toronto, and we became very good friends, actually. And she was the advisory person on all of this. She liaised with all of we people who were not social workers but were doing this sort of thing. And um, uh, when my discharge time came, actually um, our director was Adelaide Sinclair, I don't know if you remember. She was health and welfare for any, and Canada's representative with UNICEF. Mm -hmm. She was our director of friends. Uh, when she was demobilized, I more or less took over from her as staff, as a staff officer on the staff of the Chief of Naval Personnel in order to get the rest of the Wrens demobilized who were still in Britain or Victoria or mm -hmm. Ottawa, wherever. And then um, we have then, of course, uh, a program. I could have uh, taken a course in anything, you know, if I wanted to, to go to university, or I could have other, other forms of rehabilitation. And Helen Parsons sort of said to me, you know, you're a natural for social work. You really, you really should be a social worker. Well, I said, well that's interesting. <laughs> uh, I applied to um, Bedford College in London first to see if I, in order to go back home, but uh, they couldn't take me for another year. So I then I applied for the University of Toronto School of Social Work, mm -hmm. and uh, I did two years postgraduate there. It was mm -hmm. in those days a diploma. They wouldn't let me write a, 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 a thesis because they said that my diploma in physical education was not equivalent to a degree. And I actually had a letter from the University of London to say it was a, of a higher level. But they still wouldn't let me do the thesis. Hmm. <laughs> so. Anyhow, that was that. <coughs> um, what kinds of courses did you have when you were uh, at the University of Toronto? Um, well, first of all, I had to have economics, you know, as ba basic subjects. Mm -hmm. We were, a vast percentage of us were post-war, post-service people, men and women. Mm -hmm. And um, some had some, some didn't have some others, you know. I'd, I was allowed psychology because I'd had that in my teaching, teaching training. I had to study economics in the summer when I went back to England and uh, myself and write qualifying and qualifying exam when I got back and I had to do political science throughout the year with Professor Dawson and in the second summer semester I had to do sociology and write a qualifying exam because we were ex-service we were given all kinds of 
leeway to, to catch up on what was needed. Mm -hmm. Well, then, of course, there was the usual program, the history of social services and psychiatry. Um, I went also did some courses in uh, delinquency. Um, and, and I eventually did my field, or some of my field work, at the Ontario Training School. Mm -hmm. I had, uh, uh, first they thought that I should be a group worker because I'd been a phys ed teacher. And the group work course was just so elementary compared to what I had done myself that I said, this is a sheer waste of time, you know, teaching me to teach games and teaching me to teach singing things and all this sort of business. So they agreed and I went into casework. And so then I went to the Toronto Children's Aid Society for more field work. And also, um, I had been, when they thought I was going to be a group worker at the YWCA mm -hmm. for one mm -hmm. semester. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed working with the Children's Aid very much. Uh, adoptions, partially I did some adoptions. And there were a lot of very seriously disturbed people who, some of the experiences I had were really something. I was glad that I was as mature as I was, you know, mm -hmm. with the drunken husbands beach bashing their wives up and the problems of the wife and the children. It was a very good introduction to, you know, going into the field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Were there professors or other students that you knew that uh, stand out in your mind particularly? Um, <clears throat> well, Dr. Jaffray, Stuart Jaffray was uh, he was well known in the, as you know, in the pr prisoner, what do you call it, field. Not just delinquent, but the prison thing. Mm -hmm. um, um, who else was there then? Yeah, who was the director then? Um, was it Harry Cassidy? Yes, Harry Cassidy, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, isn't it hard? I, I can't remember the names. I can see the faces. Mm -hmm. The names. Mm -hmm. It's a long time ago. Yeah. Um, when you finished at the University of Toronto, you uh, you worked in. Uh, did you work in Ontario for a while? Yes, at the uh, Ontario Training School for Girls in Coburg. Was uh, that where you'd done your field placement? Too? I did a bit of uh, field work there, but mm -hmm. on the whole, I and uh, Isabel McNeil, the ex uh, Ren mm -hmm. officer, uh, was the uh, superintendent of the Ontario Training School then. Mm -hmm. So I went as her assistant. And I was in charge of the social workers there. We, I had uh, three or four others um, mm -hmm. case working and so on. And uh, it was a very interesting experience. I was only there for a year and a half, but um, um, it was pretty tough. It was 24 hours a day for seven days a week half the time because we had runaways. Uh, Isabel believed in, in uh, building up a trust thing and not locking doors. Was, the children had been pretty badly handled before that. And we had to put up with this, but um, it was very interesting. The kids were told all the time, look, you run away. You're still taking yourself with you. Mm -hmm. So what's the point? We're here to try to help you to get into a sort of better kind of a life than you've had. And um, they were all given uh, about two sessions a week with the social worker uh, just to let go, mm -hmm. do whatever they wanted to do. And they did let go sometimes. They'd throw bottles of ink all around the walls. Or sometimes they'd remain in complete silence. They were awfully disturbed, these, these girls. They really were terribly disturbed. Mm -hmm. They had desperate experiences. They, kept, they were everything from just school runaways to drug addicts. And it wasn't very good having them all together. Mm -hmm. But um, we built up this trust thing, and they were assessed uh, on a sort of score sheet. It's, I wish I had one to show you, because it was fascinating. Say we had 50% runaways the first month or something. It dwindled down to absolutely practically zero, because as the new kids came in, the old ones said, look, there's no point in you running away. You're only taking yourself <laughs> with you. <laughs> Peer therapy, is that what that's called? Yes, <laughs> that's group therapy. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Anyhow, it was good. Uh -huh. It was an experience, but by this time, you see, Newfoundland had then confederated in 49. Uh -huh. And somebody, a field, a field uh, person from the Department of Veterans Affairs, came to ask if I would think of coming back here. Yeah, yeah. Which I said no to first. 
<laughs> what? He's All right. Oh. Have we overrun the tape? <clears throat> oh, okay. Um, is, the, is the video off? If you turn the video. Um, resuming our discussion today in St. John's with Miss Frida Berry, and when um, we took a break, we were talking about uh, your return to Newfoundland. Um, why did you come back to Newfoundland, and what were you doing? Well, I'd been asked to come back by the Department of Veterans Affairs as the supervisor of the Social Service Division. They came to see me when I was in uh, Coburg. And um, because I had lived here and knew, the, knew Newfoundland and the Newfoundlanders, so I did eventually accept. I didn't in the first place because I didn't like leaving what I was doing at that time. And also the, the grading salary-wise was very poor because I told them that the cost of living here was so high that it simply wasn't feasible. So they upgraded it and uh, eventually I, I got back in uh, uh, the beginning of November of 1949. Mm -hmm. and meanwhile, uh, another uh, social worker had been seconded from Winnipeg DVA to come here to start up the office when it started up in uh, April of 49. And who was that? Uh, Ruth Dern. Ruth the mm -hmm. Dern that was. Yes. Yes. Ruth no. Winkler. <laughs> yes. Yes, I know of her. Good friend of mine. When, when you first came back then, um, what was your job as, as the uh, social service worker for the Department of Veterans Affairs? Well, it was a sort of a, a mix. Um, I was on the board for the, uh, the award of War Veterans Allowance, for one thing, uh, and <laughs> the main uh, Inter mainly the most interesting part was going and visiting. This is when I started the visiting around, I should say, around the island. In those days, it was only on the Avalon Peninsula um, because uh, I had to go and assess the situation in the homes, mm -hmm. uh, mostly for um, the purpose of seeing if they really, they really were eligible for the award of War Veterans Allowance or if there were problems where there were orphans and widows and this kind mm -hmm. of thing, would bring back a report to the board, having my own opinion about you know, whether this was an honest application and whether the need was there. Mm -hmm. Because War Veterans Allowance was worth a great deal more than a, a, a welfare assistance, you know, whatever mm -hmm. they were had in those days. Um, <clears throat> originally, it was food orders only, and it was still food orders when I came back, not money. Mm -hmm. And so another very interesting part and, and very important part was teaching people to use the money. Uh, widows who had just had these food orders, which they went to the local local store to have supplies, to get their supplies, um, now didn't know how to use money. And I would take perhaps as an example of one of those on what is known as Shea Heights now, which was the Blackhead Road, which was a very, very poverty-stricken area. Um, one widow terribly sick uh, person with, with a very bad bronchial condition, had three children. And uh, one of them was extremely ill too, with infected kidneys and so on. They lived in a, well, I say a one-room shack, but basically it was cut in two. And in the living room, as you went up the steps, all you saw was this barren room with a table and a, a wood stove and um, a bench and one or two pots, not very much at all. And the other half was where they all slept, all four of them. Damp and cold and no windows in it. Just terrible. And um, the first time I went up with Ruth Dern, uh, uh, this woman came to the door and she said, you get out of here or I'll throw this at you. He got holding, holding a full can of some some sort of food, I don't know what it was. And she just stood back on the defensive, ready to throw it. And um, so we said, well, we just came to, you know, try to help you by explaining, you know, what allowance you, you're going to have. And she wouldn't listen, she wouldn't. So we left, and then Ruth went back to Winnipeg, so I had to go up myself. And um, it, was, it was the most interesting reaction, because she stood in the doorway for a bit, she looked at me, she said, you use English, isn't you? So I said, Yes, you know. 
I liked the English common, and she was as Irish as <laughs> I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Anyhow, we, got, we became good friends, and she gradually learned to use the money. We had to buy. I, I purchased everything to start with, and then gradually gave her some money. All mm -hmm. these essentials. There was a backlog of money, always for these uh, allowances. They, they took a long time to come through and that kind of thing. So you'd have a few hundred dollars to spend. So. I purchased the absolute basics that were really essential immediately, and then slowly, slowly, she learned to use it all herself, which, mm -hmm. was, which was great. Mm -hmm. That was the kind of thing that I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> at that time, uh, what other social workers uh, d did you have contact with? Well, when I came back in '49, there was only one here, and she was the first to a Salvation Army social worker who'd been to the Toronto School, too. And who was that? Uh, Esther Perry. Mm -hmm. She's dead. She died about three or four years ago now in Toronto. And uh, she was a marvelous person. But then we had three more arrived by 1950. Um, at this point, we asked if we could become a branch of CASW, incidentally, oh. and Esther was the one who suggested that we should do this together. We only had to have five in those days to become a branch. Um, it's hard to remember who the others were now. I think one was from Nova Scotia, and she's also departed. Um, I don't remember who the mm -hmm. other two were now, but... Uh, but there were a few of you. There were five. There were five. <laughs> <laughs> just fine. Yes. One of the things that was also happening that time, at that time, or had to happen just before then, was uh, was Confederation, where uh, Newfoundland became a province of mm -hmm. Canada, having been a sovereign um, nation. Um, what effect did you see of Confederation? Well, as far as I'm concerned, nothing but good, because mm -hmm. um, of an enormous amount of money came into the province at this point. I mean, with all the allowances uh, there were for uh, pensioners, veterans, uh, mothers, I mean, dependents, everybody. Uh, uh, although we didn't have the legislation until a little later for mothers and dependents allowances, yet there was a lot of money coming from Ottawa, obviously. But uh, I must express my own opinion. I think it was put over terribly, badly over radio. Um, if you are such and such as an A's, if you haven't got this, if you have that, then you are eligible. You are eligible for this allowance, that allowance, and the other allowance. And it sounded like heaven. But it took away the initiative of an awful lot of people from doing things for themselves, from working, in actual fact. It, it was very sad to see this happen, because Newfoundland is a very independent people. And it looked as if they were just going to get money for nothing, you know. And their ill health, you know, they'd been at a pretty low par from the dietary viewpoint. But um, I, I, I didn't like to hear this way that it was put over. It said it's better to work. So if I understand you right, are you saying that the way in which Confederation was promoted, people came to believe that they would no longer have to work? But it it, it, it gave me work. that impression now. I, I'm not speaking for everybody, but it gave me that sort of impression. I wasn't here, you see, when Confederation took place in April. I mean, April 1st, I think it was, or two, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and all the discussion re confederating happened while I was in Ontario. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, when I started to travel around and talk to people here and listen to the radio, it rather horrified me. But on the other hand, as the years went by, instead of seeing these poor little wizened children with the made-over clothes from Dad's old coat, you know, this kind of thing, I'm telling you, they were all in duns and blacks and browns. They began to order through the catalogue, and the kids had coloured clothes on, and it was mm -hmm. a joy to see them. And because of the better diet, they, uh, they were growing to a more normal size. Um, I, my first impression in going around in the outports, particularly, was groups of little kids just standing there on the court, you know, just standing, doing nothing, looking pale. And now they were, they were playing games. The Americans, as a matter of fact, of course, taught them to play softball and this kind of thing. They did some very good things at this point. And the kids were eating better, they looked much healthier, their clothing was much better and brighter altogether. 
And I thank goodness for Confederation. Mm -hmm. I could really see the difference because the war did make a difference. I mean, that brought a lot of money here with the with the American forces being stationed here, mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> and uh, they employed a tremendous number of people too, mm -hmm. uh, which was also good. Mm -hmm. People had more things then; they could get their fridges and their, you know washing machines and things of that nature, mm -hmm. uh, where they had electricity. <coughs> One of the things. Um uh, your your last comment leads me to ask is that one of the there were two promises to confederation one was better social security which you've just mentioned mm -hmm. and the second was two jobs for every newfoundlander that's right and your talk about money to buy refuges uh, yeah. um, they worked like on the bases you see the people yeah did the people that as, as far as your recollection of what was going on then did newfoundlanders uh, benefit in the industry and manufacturing end of things from the promise of confederation? Well, thinking in terms of the fishery, um, I mean, as you know, our Premier then said, um, burn your boats. There are two jobs for every man. Now, he says he did not say it, but it was rife in those days <laughs> that he did say it. I mean, who knows? Anyhow, um, a lot of people gave up fishing because they because there was construction going on, a lot more construction. Um, it was it was a a funny uh, time, really. In a way, it was a thriving time for a while. Um, but the independence of people was the thing that was, in some ways, taken away. Uh, I mean, you know, a Newfoundlander can build a house with a, an axe, literally. I mean, they just have this ability. And, and boat with an axe, because they don't uh, do that now. But um, I think it came back to a degree. But in interviewing, it's, uh, I'm trying to think now what period this is. It's so hard to remember at what period, but I think it was in the DVA period. Um, they, I've completely forgotten what I was going to say now. <laughs> You're talking about building houses and boats uh, yes. and uh, their independence having been taken away. Right. And I, I'm afraid I've forgotten the point. It may mm -hmm. come back again. Mm -hmm. I know it was something flashed through my mind at this point. Uh, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the outcomes of the, uh, or I'm not sure it was an outcome, of burning the boats um, was the whole uh, idea of a resettlement from the outports to more urban areas. Were you at all involved or affected by that resettlement? Well, if I go back, for instance, when I was teaching the first seven years there, uh, some private citizens asked uh, if they could establish um, an area for uh, resettling fishermen who were not making a go of fishing at that time. And they got land at Markland, uh, not too far out of St. John's, and um, were teaching them or may, well, first they came out and they had to cut down the trees and you know till the soil and this kind of thing, and uh, the kids in school were were being taught the the values of things around them. You know, this is a wood that you use for this. A Norwegian form of of educating the fishing population mm -hmm. there, and I was at, actually I was asked to go out and um, teach singing games and things one winter. Mm -hmm. Now in those days you could only get the train as far as Whitbourne and then. I uh, was met with a sled, and uh, two or three of us went out, and we drove over the snow behind a horse and got to the school where they showed us that they were teaching the kids to use the vegetables they were growing on the land to make a good nourishing vegetable soup, mm -hmm. which the kids in turn taught their parents, which was quite interesting. But you wouldn't believe, uh, I mean, there was no insulation in that school at all. You could see the snow uh, through the cracks in the boards. It was cold. Mm -hmm. you know, it was terrific, but uh, they were doing a very good job down mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. the, uh, you were that was the first yeah, that I knew of. The it. first one. Yeah. And then during the time that you were working for the Department of Veterans Affairs, which was what? About uh, 49 to uh, 59, I guess. Okay. During that 10-year period, did you see uh, a difference, uh, how, you, how your, your clients, your DVA clients, were affected by resettlement? Um, no, there wasn't, uh, it, there wasn't much evidence of that in those days, really, although some had been resettled. Mostly and then they were resetting of their own free will, mm -hmm. you know, if they'd given up fishing. Um, but I didn't see 
too much evidence of that until I was working with the uh, children, I think, the handicapped. Um, the the effect of WVA, War Veterans Allowance, and war pensions, of course, uh, was something that made comparisons rather odious because the amount of money they got was infinitely more than they got from the provincial allowances. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were the wealthy ones in those days, and yet the money, in, in fact, wasn't extremely what do I say, it, it didn't cover the necessary costs, like that widow I was talking about who I was trying to teach to use her own money. I mean, where does $70 a month go, three mm -hmm. children? I mean, you, was, you have to think back, prices were cheaper then, but not all that cheap. I tried to budget, and it was extremely difficult to budget mm -hmm. that allowance. But they were the wealthy ones then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, during the time that you were with the uh, Departments of Veterans Affairs, um, do you have a sense, a recollection of, of what other issues, what social issues were important in uh, Newfoundland at the time? Well, first of all, um, they had no what are known as mother's allowances. And the first Minister of Welfare was appointed in this time. Um, no, wait a minute. Yes, yes, it, it was during that period. Uh, do you mind if I look up a date? Because I no, think that's that I, fine. I actually that's fine. did make a note of that. Yes, it was in '49. Actually, mm -hmm. in '49, he was appointed Dr. Hugh Herbert Pottle, and it was, this is quite interesting because it was while Ruth Dern was here, and he wanted us to read this legislation that he'd got sort of in rough draft, um, both the widows or the mother's allowance and the dependents' allowance. And we were able to have an input into that. There were certain things that looked, you know, needed to be changed a little bit. Uh, that was quite interesting, and that was a tremendous help to those who had been on welfare. Mm -hmm. um, and they, of course, were non-war widows and this kind of thing. Um, what else was going on in those days? It's, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. I can't, mm -hmm. you know, to separate one thing from another. Sure, sure. You we'll know, take a look at this and see <laughs> if there's anything on it. Oh, yes, um, Amy Lee, do you know Amy Lee Indeed. came out here? And um, she rode around with me quite a little bit when I was visiting because she was instrumental in really getting this public service thing in, into uh, gear. She did. The Public Service Act, I think, came in after that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that was, uh, that was, and the Social Assistance Act, that's what I was thinking of, came in in 54 as a result of her report. Mm -hmm. and she, was very, she was very interested in, in Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a whole time of rebuilding, I suppose, following the war. It, it is, I'm, I'm telling you, it is very difficult to separate out sure. events from 1936 right through, you know. Well, it's fine if you've just put them in wherever they occur to you yeah, and not yeah. worry about the, mm. uh, the, the dates, mm -hmm. because uh, perhaps we'll, we can sort that out later. Yes. Well, there were some other things that happened while I was away, of course. That was, that was uh, of course, it was, as I say, a commission of government, mm -hmm. uh, you know, after Newfoundland went into the red. And they were here when I came back. Mm -hmm. And I knew quite a few of those commissioners, and some of them were, were quite good. Um, I told you the School Attendance Act came in '42, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a training, summer training for teachers in those days too, which took place in the old Memorial University. Um, many teachers then uh, only had about grade 10 education, some just grade 9. And they came in, in in the summer to have summer school training, and I did the guide work with them, actually, drilling. And it was it was interesting. You see, they came from their own community and went back to their own community, so they didn't get a wide education, should be say. I mean, they weren't able to talk in world terms or even, mm -hmm. even whole of Newfoundland terms. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that it was the, it was the beginning of bringing them into a 
bigger community where they could see a little bit more. Mm -hmm. St John's wasn't this size then. Yes. Uh, didn't have all its facilities. <coughs> there were, uh, while I was dealing with the veterans, this is another thing that occurs to me, there was a lot of illiteracy. Um, you know, many of them could only sign an X. And the, uh, the women were better educated than the men very often because as boys they'd go off to the fishery quite young. And the girls would, in many cases, be able to come in here and become clerks, or they uh, would be teach they'd go as far as the teachers or, or typists and this kind of thing. So they would have a higher level of education than the men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was a very interesting place, um, branch, where a tremendous number of, um, of single men. The girls did not go back. And if they did, they didn't want to marry men who had no real education. Mm -hmm. uh, incredible, as it may seem. <laughs> I think those are the main things that mm -hmm. I sort of made a note of. Well, perhaps now we could turn to um, uh, the work that you did after you left the Department of Ves Veterans Affairs. Uh, yes, well, again, I, I was asked to start the social service department in the um, what was then the old sunshine camp and now the children's rehabilitation center um, it was uh, one of the projects that one of the um, uh, uh, rotary groups had undertaken uh, there'd been very bad polio epidemics um, i think starting in about 53 54 and there were more in right up to 60 61 um, in really almost all around the island, and um, there were no treatment centers for polio victims. And uh, they had started this up, and it was called the Sunshine Camp out on the Thorburn Road here, and had physiotherapists and nurses, of course, and um, then wished to have occupational therapists plus somebody to organize social work. So they asked me to go. and. Um, I did, and I'm very glad I did. It was very interesting starting up something new like that. <coughs> and um, the children were so fascinating. I mean, they're mentally bright, you know, but very, very disabled. Uh, one little one came in, she was about six months or a little more, uh, totally paralyzed from the neck down from it, very pretty kid. And, um, we also eventually uh, took some cerebral palsy when the polio thing, you know, it, it, due to the uh, um, ejections and so on, they um, gradually wiped out the polio everywhere, uh, which leads me to something else I must tell mm -hmm. you about Christmas seal. But um, we took cerebral palsy and spina bifida mm -hmm. uh, mainly. And it uh, and now, as it is, of course, there are very few polios. Well, if if any, they're adult, of mm -hmm. course. So that now it's uh, mainly the other categories. And um, it was rather like a a, ho a ho very homey atmosphere there. It was an old wooden building, um, nothing special at all. But mm -hmm. the kids enjoyed life there, and uh, we were able to do quite a lot to help them. But we were also offered. The opportunity. I travelled a lot for them around the island. We, one could drive a good deal further then, of then, course. Yes. Um, there was no road across until <coughs> 49, I guess it was, mm -hmm. or later, I don't remember. Uh, anyhow, um, we were invited to sail on the, go on the Christmas seal, which the, the Tuberculosis Association vessel that went round the coast x raying and so on, because there were not roads, you know, in certain places at all. And um, so the first one I went on was on the south coast. We, we, uh, where did we get on board? Um, oh, gee, Grand Bank, I guess. And we would sail into the inlets there. And <laughs> it was quite an experience. They had a loud hailer thing, and they'd play the Newfoundland records, and the sound would re reverberate between the cliffs. And um, we had somebody from the Diabetic Association there, and he did most of the announcing. He'd say, this is the Christmas seal coming to your community. Will you all please come on board, bringing your specimens with you? <laughs> <laughs> and we, 
<laughs> it was really a funny sight. <laughs> they come down with bottles, everything from a, a beer bottle down to a scent bottle. I don't know how they managed that, but <laughs> <laughs> they did. And um, uh, they would come aboard. If we could tie up, we tied up. But if mm -hmm. we couldn't, they would come in small boats. And you see yes. women rowing themselves out, you know. And uh, they had, um, we, preceding us had been the nurse, the nurses in the small boat, and they'd gone and done various uh, tests and things of that mm -hmm. nature. And then we, the x-rays were taken on board. And my job was to locate the any people, adult or children, with disabilities. And it didn't matter whether it was sight or hearing or, you know, anything at all. And uh, so then we referred these back to their own organization, if mm -hmm. it was blind, CNIB, you know, and that sort of thing. Uh, if there were physical disability, then we would uh, look after that. And mm -hmm. uh, unless they were adults, and we had to refer those to other medical sources. And um, oh, there were some amazing experiences there. Mm -hmm. It really, it was, <laughs> it was really interesting. Yeah, I'll tell you another naughty story. <laughs> Oh, sure. it's really funny. Uh, there was there was uh, one woman. I don't know if she's alive now. I very much doubt. She had been a, a nurse in World War One, in the Queen Victoria something. Uh, one of those nursing organisations that functioned in World War One, and a very interesting person, very tall, majestic, and obviously well educated person. And she had a brother who was an amputee, a veteran amputee. And my job was to see her brother uh, and see how the wheelchair was going, this kind of thing. And um, she came on board and saying she couldn't manage to bring a specimen then, but if I came after lunch it would be all right, you see. So I went down the wharf and down to the house and she started hunting for this bottle. Couldn't find it, she's hunted and hunted. And finally she removed some newly baked loaves and there it was just behind the bread. So she gave it to me, and I had a, a long pocket in my coat, you see, and sort of just pushed it in. I was walking down the wharf back to the boat when I felt something dripping down my legs. <laughs> Don't need to say any more. <laughs> Somebody forgot to put a lid on. <laughs> it wasn't tightly screwed up. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, so we went up north to White Bay the next time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Same sort of experiences. A couple of particular questions occur to me about the experience that you had there. One is you made two um, significant changes there, at least from an outsider's point of view. Mm. One is from government to what I assume was Private. the military sector. Uh, yeah. uh, and second was from veterans mm -hmm. to disabled and from grown-ups to kids. Yeah. How did you deal with those changes? Didn't seem to work bother me. I don't <laughs> know. <laughs> um, you see, with DVA, there was a lot of, uh, of board meetings and things, uh, going through files and looking at the papers of the applicants for war veterans allowance and so on. You know, you get a bit bored with that, anyhow. Yeah. Uh, I felt, you know, 10 years there was, was enough in any case. And I so liked the doctor who was running the uh, children's rehab, well, the Sunshine Camp then, uh, his attitude towards and the need that he felt for a social social worker, that his attitude was such a nice one because there weren't many doctors who even heard of social workers in those days, that it would be sort of nice to work with somebody like that. And we had a wonderful team there. That we were really, it was really a delightful place to work in. Everybody was permitted their opinion, you know, from the, we say the physiotherapist would give her, <coughs> her sort of report on the uh, examination of the, child coming in, the OT would do the same, the nurse would do the same. I would talk about the social situation in the home that I'd visited and so on. The doctor would record all this on tape and then come to a decision about treatment and how long and all this sort of thing. And it, would, it was just so satisfying to work with a group of thoroughly interested people. Mm -hmm. um, rather lost that in a way when they moved to the uh, um, old American school in Fort, what was Fort Pepperell in Pleasantville now, um, it was turned into the Children's Rehabilitation Centre and became more like a hospital, mm -hmm. uh, sort of taking children's temperatures two or three times a day. They weren't sick, they were there for treatment, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, the atmosphere, well, we lost two of our um, 
directors, really, one doctor after the other. Um, and one got too busy to sort of be there very much, and it sort of fell apart, really. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of interesting records there I would love to get back at, but uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was asked then to, uh, to take over the, or the Anglican Orphanage in its last stages, really. Uh, Did you know at the time that you went there that it was in its last stages? No, no. Um, that's again, is rather too long a story. I'd been on a committee to advise on what kind of an orphanage they should have, because they had a boys and a girls, and they'd sold the land where our present Arts and Culture Center is. And um, do you remember um, oh, who came down from Toronto, who ran the Protestant orphanage there for many, many years? Nora Lee. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nora came down here <coughs> in order to give her advice on this, and she <coughs> she uh, felt the cottage plan system was the answer at this time. Um, but they threw this out, actually, and built this one big building, which was very unfortunate, because you get boys and girls from four years to 21 under one roof, you've got a lot of problems, uh -huh. about a hundred of them. Uh -huh. And uh, it wasn't a good experience. They were in the red, eventually, anyhow, and closed it down, which was exactly what I hoped they'd do. Because most of them went back either to their own homes or to foster homes, and were, they were much happier. Mm -hmm. So the term orphanage then? It wasn't an orphanage. Uh, although some were orphans, but uh, a lot were just uh, broken homes, children from broken homes, mm -hmm. or parents who were mentally sick or something like that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Was it a place where um, kids who uh, had been uh, judged to be delinquent would go? No, no. no. The boys' home training school here for the boys and a small one for the girls. Mm -hmm. no. mm -hmm. Some of them were very delinquent. Mm -hmm. We had some little thieves there, very definitely, just because of their background. I know one little boy from the West had been taught to steal, mm -hmm. you know, to go into vans and steal things, and he continued to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he ended in the boys' training school, of course. Um, in, in such a situation where, where the, <coughs> the program, perhaps, or perhaps it was even the, the reason for which the organization existed, was somewhat um, at least unpleasant in your mind, uh, if not more than unpleasant. <coughs> yes. How, does, how, does, uh, how, how did you as a social worker deal with that? Uh, um, with, with, with the board, uh, with the community? Yes, and with it, it wasn't an easy situation. I don't yeah. much like talking about it, to tell you the truth. Mm. Um, they didn't understand these kids needed love more than anything else. They didn't need punishment. And they had been in the habit of punishing uh, to a very cruel degree, as far as I'm concerned. And mm -hmm. they thought I was out of my mind to say these kids needed love. They needed understanding. Mm -hmm. And I refused to allow any more corporal punishment of any kind. It was, it was like Dickens, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the house mothers, who were not very well educated at that time, said, well, what punishments can we give? And mm -hmm. I said, you're not here to punish. You're here to help them. And if you can't cope with any child, just send that child to me or bring that child to me. And I, they didn't like it. Mm -hmm. They didn't like it. They no. were, they would rather bash them. Yeah. What kind of foster home, or what, to what extent did foster home and, and the cottage placements um, exist in St. John's at the time? Well, the government were responsible for the foster homes. And of course, we worked closely with them because they allotted money to each orphan was, you know, allotted so much. Or they had funds which paid for the orphans, in other words, because they would never have enough from, from the church funds. Um, so they had the foster homes, and they did all the job of placing them in the foster homes. I was given two days' notice to go because they knew that I would object to them doing certain things like separating brothers and sisters and mm -hmm. sending them to different parts of the island and that kind of thing, which I didn't like. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, it was a lack of understanding 
of mm -hmm. children psychologically, mm -hmm. which bothered me very much. And they didn't like me either. Mm -hmm. So you didn't stay, didn't stay long? Well, it closed down. Mm -hmm. I was I thankful it closed down. Um, another thing that happened somewhere around that time, and I'm not sure that it was precisely then, is I understand that the, uh, what had been called the Home for the Aged and Infirm closed. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other name for that was the poor house. Originally, yeah. 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 Was was there I, a relationship, uh, some kind of um, change in in social thought that led to those institutions closing down around the same I time? I think so. Yes, I think so. Definitely. Uh, it took a, many years to get the old home for the aged and infirm uh, completely wiped out. It, it was just gradual moving. I had to go there to visit people from time to time, um, and it was a terrible place. But there was a diff definite change. See, we had the first Minister of Welfare, as I say, and he was a very wise man, actually. And uh, they did bring in legislation about these things. I don't know exactly what happened with regard to the home for the aged and firm. I only know they have this new Hoyles home for um, senior citizens now, which really takes the place of that, and it's not bad, I mean, mm -hmm. as good as it can be under the circumstances. Uh, very costly, I think, to the government. If people have their own income or have uh, an allowance of some kind, they pay for themselves there, but um, otherwise they have to be maintained by the government. Mm -hmm. It seems to me rather like a place to die, but you know, even young people have to live there uh, for instance, uh, one young polio that I knew as a baby, as an adult, is living there. Uh, she could live in a group home, I think, if somebody were able to take care. She's working, I and mean, she's, she's full of being. She's a marvelous kid, but, and in an electrically controlled wheelchair. But she now prefers to stay up there. But there are some who were depressed very much because people were dying in these mm -hmm. old people's homes. Yeah. However, um, when you left uh, the orphanage, uh, where did you go then? <laughs> I, I took a few months off, <laughs> uh -huh. but I went to see the medical school was on the books. It was going to open at the university, so I went to see uh, the dean, who I'd known all, pretty well all the years I'd been here, to ask if there was likely to be any opening for somebody with my qualifications. As I was old, I was in my 60s then, um, and he said he thought there was just something if I wouldn't mind waiting until the following February uh, when a, uh, a doctor was coming out from England to head up the community, um, uh, <laughs> I keep saying community services now, um, the Department of Community Medicine. And uh, he, he was working on a project uh, which had been started in Britain and was going to be finished here. And uh, I, I got the job. <laughs> it had declared to have me sort of thing, which was marvelous for me at my age. Otherwise, I could have gone to the mainland. I'd heard of one or two things that would have been interesting there, but I didn't want to leave Newfoundland. And um, so I became a, a research assistant in the Department of Community Medicine. And the first project was to do with neurotic women who were attending clinics um, for whom th this was run out of the Placentia Cottage Hospital down Placentia Bay. And uh, uh, they were appearing at the outpatient clinic there with no possible cause physically that the doctor could see for wanting the pills that were keeping them calm and this sort of thing. And they were first interviewed by a psychiatrist, um, and I didn't know who were the the actual cases and who were the uh, the uh, com what do you call them the um, comparative ones, mm -hmm. control patients. Mm -hmm. Although it was pretty obvious when I went to the homes to interview them what was what. The thing was to find out whether it was the social situation that was creating these neuroses with women, and. Uh, well, to put a long story short, with equally matched families, uh, the control ones were actually on low income earnings, 
and basically the, uh, the index cases were on welfare. And the difference between their home situations was incredible. There was a sort of a, a, a pride, the fact that they were earning a living, even though the money was not much more, if any more, than the people on, on, well, on assistance. Um, but the people who were not working had terrible problems. They, they had so many things that I had to refer to the department. It was amazing that things were happening like this. A woman had a husband who had had an injury whilst on a fishing vessel, and he had the most terrible headaches. And he simply, he was un, unable to work, but he had no compensation for this. They said he was just malingering. And her children were walking through their shoes, and they were self-conscious about going to school. They had to go by bus, uh, and they wouldn't go some days. Their house, which was as damp as any other bed house I've seen, with water running down the walls, literally the beds were all wet against the wall, had again just the stove and the table and the bench. The fire uh, wood stove had, the back had gone, she couldn't bake bread anymore. They owed two to three hundred dollars to the local grocer and she was in a state of absolute dementia and he was drinking in order to relieve the pain, you know, this kind of a thing. Uh, it was a very, very interesting project that we had a hundred cases actually, and uh, the, finished it up on the south side, on the Shea Heights here, the last few families. Um, and the findings were absolutely as one would expect them to be, that the social problem was the thing that was creating the neuroses. Mm -hmm. Well, what bothers me about many of these papers that come out is who reads them and who follows up on them. I think, I think there must have been some connection here, but um, a lot of projects that I've worked on, I've never seen a paper from, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is sort of sad. Seems to be the case with a lot of research. Yeah, yeah. So you continued on in that kind of role uh, until your retirement, did you? Yes, I, I worked for, on several projects. There was the, <coughs> the resettlement one was another one. I was on loan to the psychology department to run the team that was interviewing around the island, <coughs> seeing people who'd uh, been resettled or who were about to be resettled. And uh, my finding in those days, that there was a lot of unhappiness, a lot of misery from this. Uh, it had to come. I think it had to come because they couldn't get the same sort of education, the same sort of health services as other people were getting, but you know, some of them didn't mind about this at all. Um, I'm thinking that in the Placentia Bay area, they moved them off the islands in Placentia Bay into Placentia itself or other areas near there. And uh, our mothers found that their children were not as healthy because at home they ate good wholesome food. They were out of doors every spare moment. They actually had a good teacher, and they had a nurse who was uh, local people who were quite happy to be on the island. And when they came in to Placentia, uh, they had to go to school by bus. They had to, first of all, she gave them a lunch to take with them, of, you know, good sandwiches and some fruit and this kind of thing. Uh, and then the kids said they wanted to be like all the others. They wanted a quarter to get Coke and chips. And they were always, they were being subject to an awful lot of colds and bronchitis and everything else. They never had a chance of physical activity in the fresh air. They didn't sleep well. They didn't eat well. Mm. And it, it, that, was, that was very sad. <coughs> the husband, in order to earn a living, had to go to Labrador. Mm -hmm. That was the only way. He'd been a fisherman. But a lot of families had gone back to the island in the summer, you know, to, to fish again. Mm -hmm. And the, socially, the, she said, this, I'm thinking of one particular family now, I can't, there were others too. She said, we used to get together on all the feast days and birthdays and have parties, and we, we got together and hooked our rugs and did whatever other handicrafts they were used to. And we had a lot of fun, but she said, I don't know where anybody is now. They were spotted all around the outskirts of Placentia and up the shore, down the shore, and um, the, fish, the men, were not able to fish from where they were actually living, unless they had a telephone, and many of them didn't. 
They could never get in touch with their friends. They didn't have the money to have a car. There were no bus. There was no bus service, so they were absolutely isolated and very unhappy, and a great deal more alcoholism amongst the men. And the wives were just, you know, they were trodden down by this. Mm -hmm. so that was my impression of a lot of it, but. There were others which were bad too because they were put into communities which had no soil, you know, on, on rock, literally, and away from the sea. And the, the young people would just go, you know, they, they would leave these places. On the other hand, they have had facilities which they didn't have before. It's an awfully moot question. I mean, are you free to do what you want in this world, or are you coerced? And they were coerced to move. There's no doubt about that, mm -hmm. politically. And um, do you accept this coercion? Some are happy. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've never had a follow-up on that research project, and this is where Stuart Godfrey was interested in, you know, what has happened. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the uh, people who ran the project disappeared from our ken, destroyed what information they had. Hmm. One of these situations between husband and wife, a husband and wife team. Mm -hmm. They parted company, they destroyed everything. So we can't, could never check the names of the people who were interviewed. Which is Tragedy. sad. So I don't know, I mean, <coughs> which, which, is, which is beneficial, which isn't. Mm -hmm. What do you mm -hmm. do? Yeah. And what's the social worker's role in this, in these changes? Uh, <coughs> one, one wonders. I don't know, because you know, I was basically only on the research end of this. Mm -hmm. um, if there was anything that needed reporting, of course I would, but uh, we just hoped there would be a follow-up. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And I think possibly the welfare officers. You see, when I first came, there were only what you call relieving officers here. They were not very well educated, they didn't have training or anything, and their job was to relieve distress and to remove the relief if they found that the, anybody was earning a dollar or so extra. And it was very punitive, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, well, then they had welfare officers who had training in summer schools and this sort of thing, and gradually, of course, it's, it's grown into trained people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, over the years, uh, from 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 the original five of you who were enough to start a branch of CASW, were you involved um, with the professional association over the years of your employment here oh, in yeah. Newfoundland? <laughs> there were so few of us, because we'd, we'd get 11 and then maybe we got to 17, of course, right mm -hmm. here. We all took everything in turn, as it were, you know, you'd be the president and the secretary and the treasurer. But I was on the on the national board, let's say, 19, 1950. To 1971, uh -huh. right? 19 years. Yes, that's what you told me. Right? Yeah, uh -huh. um, on and off. I mean, there were there was a, probably off for a year somewhere. I don't know, but uh, it had to be somebody whose employer uh, would allow you to go to board meetings when necessary. But to start with, it was all correspondence. One didn't go to Ottawa or anywhere where they, they were having board meetings because there wasn't the money. Uh, you know, pay travel for all people coming across Canada. Mm -hmm. And then um, slowly, you know, we, we went to regular board meetings and it was a very interesting experience. And, uh, I was very impressed by the quality of so many people on the board. There were, there were really some good heads there. Mm -hmm. They knew what they mm -hmm. were talking about. I felt very humble and shy. I said, there's nothing I can say. There's so few of us. That <laughs> we 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 did come out on some issues. Um, the woods. Do you remember uh, the um, the wood woods workers? That great shamozel that was going on in central Newfoundland. What did they call it? Oh yes, um, I, I I know of what. I didn't make a note speaking, of that. Yep. Yeah, we um, the board member then was Margaret Garland, and she took a, a written report up to the board on this mm -hmm. situation. We took a stand on that. But you see, with so few. And all being busy, there was very little progress in, in that area of taking stands on issues. Mm -hmm. uh, it's grown and grown now. They're being very, very active. I'm very interested in this young group now that mm -hmm. are, are really going ahead and mm -hmm. showing themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where I was. Mm. Um, 
you've had, uh, besides your, your paid employment, you've also been involved in organizations on a volunteer basis. What kinds of organizations have you, been well, or are you involved in now? <laughs> I, I was involved for many years on the board of the um, Paraplegic Association, Canadian Paraplegic Association, the Newfoundland branch here. Uh, I just managed to get off it about a year or so ago. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, But as a result, um, uh, there's a community services council here who are, v are very good at, at, at uh, getting people in, on projects. And um, we, uh, they started up uh, a committee to uh, look into the legislation with regard to uh, accessibility of buildings. And um, I eventually became the chairman. I said I would never take it on. But uh, we had, we got the legislation through and we continued um, to have an interest in this, and still, although we've not exactly disbanded, we're not meeting now, because our, our main thing, thing was to get the, the act through, um, and to follow up to make sure that there was, they were doing the proper inspection and that mm -hmm. people were complying, and it's going pretty well now, mm -hmm. so we're sort of dormant at the moment. Mm -hmm. But also, um, I am on the board and the selection committee for a place called Civic Number no. 4 Eskasoni Place, which is the first adult group home for physical, uh, physically handicapped. And it's very interesting. Um, we are getting them through quite quickly with their training to make themselves self-sufficient so they can go and live either on their own or with someone else. They can cook and they can clean and they can do the laundry and, you know, the men and the women, too. It, it's very good. It's, it's going well. So we have board meetings every month and a selection committee whenever it's needed to interview the people who are ap applying for admission there. So that's one. And then I'm, uh, <laughs> I just recently um, got to take them in on the... A new Horizons program for the hard of hearing senior citizens, and we're all uh, retired or senior. Uh, Dr. Nora Brown here, as a pediatrician, is the person who's really spearheaded this. We have a hearing association of Newfoundland, and we are a committee really of that association now, in order to um, learn about all the aids there are for the hard of hearing to store them in our homes, to be able to go and talk to people about how to use and see any problems that might, might come, come about. Now, we haven't got the grant yet. We're just hoping it'll come through for, mm -hmm. uh, I think we've got enough to get some of the initial aids. Um, and then um, we will start our work probably in the fall in, in I would say in the autumn sometime and the other thing I'm interested in is a volunteer called a friend of the park of the Oxen Pond Botanic Park here mm -hmm. I man the desk uh, on Sunday mornings about twice a month I suppose mm -hmm. and inform people where they go and what they do and answer their questions <laughs> and also do a little clearing up in the place and walking around the trails and seeing that nobody's damaging things yeah. and so on yeah and taking a course in various uh, plants and herbs and things so that I know a little bit more. Uh, so I keep sort of busy. It sounds like you're <laughs> a very... Apart from having all this to look after. <laughs> very active volunteer. I'm wondering if we can move now to a couple of general questions as we're moving sort of toward the end of our, our mm -hmm. time together. Mm -hmm. One is um, um, about the most significant changes that you've seen in Newfoundland that affect social welfare? You've been here for more than 40 years. Huh? Well, I suppose Confederation was the thing. No. What would I say? World War II started something going here mm -hmm. because of the employment of so many Newfoundlanders by the, on the American bases. There's mm -hmm. one on the West Coast, one here, one down Argentia. And uh, that is, in other words, the economy improved considerably. That was a big change, and I could see that when I came back, of course. Um, Confederation was the other great mm -hmm. change. Um, 
one of the difficulties has been originally of not having enough qualified people in different fields. Then, of course, we had the extension and the university blossomed forth and um, with so many faculties now, uh, they have, Newfoundlanders are now trained to take the positions that they used to have to import people for before. That's, that's a, a very great improvement. Um, what else has happened? Well, I suppose in a way resettlement has done something, but I'm not sure, and I'd prefer not to give an opinion upon it. I really am not sure about that. Mm -hmm. When I am told just recently that people are moving back to where they came from, and I know of one particular uh, area um, up the east coast. Um, mm -hmm. I was there two years ago myself. It's an island which has now got a causeway to it, uh, which was part of Mr. Smallwood's uh, resettlement plan, and he was trying to get them off the island. Uh, they have come back, even the young have come back, and there's a big fish plant there now, and it's become a, a settlement again, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is quite interesting that you see that it's worked in some places and it hasn't worked in other yeah. places. Yeah. And the people make a difference, mm -hmm. what their aspirations are and what energy they've got to, mm -hmm. to get things going. So there's a lot of, a, a lot of changes from mm -hmm. that. I don't know what else I could say. Uh, well, the oil, <laughs> the hope of oil. Uh, there's a lot of construction gone on, a lot mm -hmm. of selling of homes. Um, resuming our discussion. Dogs will come in again. <laughs> Maybe we'll stop again. Just a minute. Um, okay, we were talking about uh, changes uh, in Newfoundland that you had seen affecting social welfare. Were there others that you wanted to mention, or, or were you at the end of that? Uh, I was going to say <laughs> <laughs> the oil, the, the, the oil? coming of the, the oil, oil. Yes. The sort of thing. Well, it hasn't come yet, but we know there's a lot there. And uh, there's been a great deal of construction, purchasing of land and storage of the offshore supplies, which is all around this area here. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, that has afforded some, I suppose, some employment, but we're suffering like everybody else from the present e economic situation and our rate of unemployment I think is 17 percent at least at the moment which is pretty high mm -hmm. and there's all the argument you know in the fishery too and but some of the plants have now opened again which is something I, I hope and I'm always an optimist that, that things will go for the best I think we need a change of government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, this, it, it's, it's a very, very difficult point right now with, with our situation, the PC government and the Liberals in power and the money going to the Liberal ridings and not to the PC ridings and so on, so that we don't get what we should have spread across uh, you know, the various areas here. But um, I think that it will be on the up by 85 probably and there will be more employment. Mm -hmm. I, I sincerely hope so because it's been a pretty grinding time for most people here. The prices here are ter terrible mm -hmm. and the uh, tax is 11% mm -hmm. which is very very high for it's people the, uh, on, on fixed incomes. Provincial sales tax? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Prices start high and then you've got 11% on it you know mm -hmm. so that nobody can say live well but I think the thing is but people have, they want to live too high nowadays. I mean, if you need, you can't have just one car in the family, and you have to have a sailboat, you know, and, and this sort of thing, this, which they very often get from the media, mm -hmm. how other people live, has sort of expanded their horizons to such a degree that they're not very satisfied with an ordinary good check. They mm -hmm. want more mm -hmm. on their paycheck. Oh, that's not just here. No, no, indeed here. it's not. I wonder if in looking back over your career, uh, you, there are uh, particular challenges that you remember. Challenges in the work, you mean, in, mm. in my... 
Well, I suppose they've all been challenging because they've been so different. Mm -hmm. um, I've enjoyed every job but one that I've ever had. And uh, uh, I've enjoyed sort of adjusting myself, I suppose, to them. It, it, it's, it's just one of these things, I don't know, I, I suppose I'm empathetic with people so that I've not found it difficult to get what I wanted done. And um, I'm not sort of praising myself or anything, but it is easy for me to handle people usually, whether they're children. I love kids, especially the difficult kids, the adolescents. Um, and I just have not found it hard to get on in any job. I suppose lots of things have been challenges, but uh, oh, gee. I can't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's, that's fair. How about things about which you're particularly pleased that you did? Accomplishments? Well, I suppose I'm pleased with what I've done with and for the physically disabled because I've con maintained an interest ever since I went to the children's rehab. Um, and I know these people as adults now. I go to their dances and their dinners and see them dancing in their wheelchairs and we have a lovely time together. And, and to me, this is one of the biggest satisfactions. I really, I really do feel that's the biggest, perhaps, of all. Mm -hmm. they've, they've come to be such people, some of them. I mean, people who had been judged as mm, mentally slow or not very bright are on the faculty of the university, you know, mm -hmm. this sort of thing, because they haven't had a chance before. Though, I mean, many of the disabled here couldn't get to school mm -hmm. for years. Uh, they would come into the centre and they would get their education there, and they'd go back home and they couldn't go into school yeah. because of the terrain. I mean, if they were in a wheelchair and they had to go up rocky hills, they just couldn't make it. Yes. Yeah. But one of the interesting things it was going round to and very satisfying, probably with a phys uh, um, an occupational therapist, to get school principals to put ramps into their buildings. Mm -hmm. And that was way back, you see. Now it's in the building code and this kind of a thing that, to make entrances possible for them. But in those days, you had to go and speak individually to every school principal. And mm -hmm. they did it, you know. Mm -hmm. it, the best of their ability, they did ramp places. It wasn't all a question of wheelchairs, but mostly. If this was so, but they, they've been great achievers, mm -hmm. and so they, you know, they, you feel very warm <laughs> towards them. The courage that some of them have is incredible, mm -hmm. because now we're getting para and quadriplegics from accidents, an awful lot of them, young men mostly, some women who have been riding motorbikes and have accidents or had a diving accident or in the forces and had a accident in the forces, which has caused them to become paraplegic or quadriplegic. But they've got a great deal of courage. Oh, I love working with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I should probably stay on the board for quite a while at <laughs> the, the group home, and, you know. <laughs> you've, you've done so much in your career. Uh, that's really quite amazing. It's been a long one. People keep saying, why? You've had such an interesting life. Why don't you write it up? I can't see this any more interesting than most people's, but well, you know. <laughs> you've made, certainly made a contribution. I've had the chance of going to some international uh, conferences and so on, too, which has been interesting. And mm -hmm. uh, all the time I was working, really, I went to, where the, when the international conference was within reasonable traveling distance, mm -hmm. And one particular one was in Greece, which I enjoyed extremely. I actually had to chair the uh, meeting on the physically disabled at that one, mm -hmm. which was another interesting experience where they were all speaking different tongues. <laughs> yeah, <imagine. laughs> And most of them came forth in English, but there was a trans translation, of course, yeah. in those days. Yeah. So that was, that was sort of nice. Mm -hmm. I went on a, an Aegean trip as part of my holiday while I stayed yes. there. Yes, it would be lovely. I, I came back on the plane one time with um, uh, Israel's premier, what's her name, what was her Golda name? Meyer. Uh, Golda Meir. Golda sat next to her. It was fascinating. She'd been to the, to the International Conference in Toronto that year. The International Conference on Social Work? Yeah. <laughs> Social <laughs> Welfare, I think they called it. it. Must have been a fascinating discussion. Very, very, very interesting. Unfortunately, it was only a short trip from Toronto to Montreal, but 
it was worthwhile. Indeed. I didn't realize who she was, to tell you the truth. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I just dawned a little later. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, I wonder if, in closing, there's anything that you'd like to add. Any, any, uh, any more naughty stories, or <laughs> <laughs> no, not particularly that, but anything you'd like no. to, uh, um, to add on. That there are so many things that it is very difficult suddenly to think of any one thing. Gosh, uh, to I, w I was thinking of something the other day, and now it's gone again total number of experiences of interest. One perhaps very sad thing, I was looking for disabled children and um, I'd been told that in a certain home in this specific community there was a, a cerebral palsy child and I went to uh, the door and there was this mother who was an English war bride who was obviously gone to seed. Her husband had left her and I said, oh, I came to visit from children's rehab to visit Tommy or whatever his name was. Oh, yes, yeah, she said, and she opened up the side of a coal bin, a wooden coal bin by the stove, hot as Hades, and she lifted this child out. And you know what a plant looks like if it has no light? It's just white, white cerebral palsy athetoid. I, mean, I can't describe it, it was like a ghostly appearance, and she kept this child, practically naked in that. <laughs> Fortunately, that was a referral to the Department of Social Services and they removed this kid. I would think he didn't live very long myself. Mm -hmm. that, that was one of my horrors. I shouldn't end up with a horror, mm -hmm. should I? <laughs> <laughs> well, in a, in a way, though, I think you're you're, you're not ending up because the the uh, the work, the positive work that you did at the Sunshine Camp, um, and in your further volunteer work Which. with disabled people, I think uh, adds a positive light to that story. Yeah, yeah. There are funny things. Though. There are lots of funny things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've had to camp out, you know, and visits, but I couldn't find anywhere to sleep. I had to put up a tent in the pouring rain. Oh my. <laughs> experiences like that. <laughs> yes, how did you claim for that on your expense account? <laughs> <laughs> didn't. <laughs> well, perhaps that's a more positive note to, to end on. <laughs> yes, there were many yeah. rough days and nights. <laughs> yeah. Well, in conclusion, then, I'd like to thank you very much for spending time with us this afternoon. I very much enjoyed it and found it uh, very informative. Thank Thanks you very, very much. much. I hope I've done what you wish me to do. Yep. <laughs>